on Yeats and the Learning of the Imagination, the title, of course, of one of Kathleen Raine's books. Um, it was her book, Defending Ancient Springs, 1967, that was purchased and read by me when I was an undergraduate in Australia. I still have it. It helped to awaken my interest in the writings of Yeats. I first met her at the Yeats Summer School in Sligo in 1970 and in 72, where her lectures anticipated her books, Yeats, The Tarot and the Golden Dawn, 1972, and Yeats, The Initiate, 1986. She shared Yeats's sense that there are ways of knowing more appropriate to the production and reception of art than those of shuffling editors, of whom, as you've just heard, I am one. Bald heads, said Yeats, forgetful of their sins, old, learned, respectable, bald heads, who edit and annotate the lines that young men, tossing on their beds, rhymed out in love's despair to flatter beauty's ignorant ear. Mea culpa. <laughs> I, I hope Yeats's re rebuke propitiates the lofty shade of Kathleen Rain. As an advisory editor of my journal, she wrote of one particular submission, this young woman, for I judge her to be a young woman, would be well advised to join a magical order so that the veils of illusion can be stripped off her one by one advice which I did not pass on. <laughs> As a poet, Kathleen Rain depended upon centuries of book learning. As, an, as a scholar, she compounded it. Her book had brought me to Yeats's inexhaustible library of book learning, the British Museum, where occasionally she was to be glimpsed. She took it for granted that the imagination was learned, as had Yeats before her. Um, the most important parts of some of these quotes I put up are those in red. There is only one kind of good poetry, he said, for the poetry of the coteries, which presupposes the written tradition, does not differ in kind from the true poetry of the people, which presupposes the unwritten tradition. Both are alike strange and obscure and unreal to all who have not understanding and both glimmer with thoughts and images. I learned from the people themselves before I learned it from any book that they cannot separate the idea of an art or a craft from the idea of a cult with ancient technicalities and mysteries. They can hardly separate mere learning from witchcraft and are fond of words and verses that keep half their secret to themselves. Um, so this is his justification for being a learned poet working in an unlearned tradition. Many years after he had worked on these notebooks at the turn of the 20th century, he recalled when he began to question the Irish country people about apparitions. Lady Gregory and I co uh, collected the stories in her visions and beliefs in the west of Ireland. Again and again, she and I felt we'd got down, as it were, into some fibrous darkness into some matrix out of which everything has come, some condition that brought together, as though into a single scheme, exaltations, agonies, the apparitions seen by dogs and horses, but there was always something lacking. We came upon visionaries of whom it was impossible to say whether they were Christian or pagan, found memories of jugglers like those of India, found fragments of a belief that associated eternity with field and road, not with buildings. But these visionaries, memories, fragments were eccentric, alien, shut off, as it were, under the plate glass of a museum. I had found something of what I wanted, but not all. The explanatory intellect had disappeared. The key phrase in all that, I think, is fibrous darkness. The beliefs of the country people, he thought, were ancient deposits, like sods of turf rotted down, as it were, into tradition. Recovered by visionary meditation upon learning, in his case, the writings of the Irish mythographers and folklorists, such beliefs could prove endlessly inspiriting. 
middle-class Ireland, he felt, had prolific journal journalism. It had Young Ireland societies. It had cultural and national fervor. But he said, no, and I'm quoting him here, cultivated minority. Hence, he thought, the Irish absorption of English middle-class values and popular poetry. He plied his audiences with folklore essays, barely read now. He offered folkloric notes to his over-freighted symbolical poems. The Wind Among the Reeds, 1899, contains just 37 poems in 62 pages, with an additional 44 pages of notes, some of them as long as eight pages. He later pruned them, forcing the poems to become self-sufficient. Though by 1932, he had found what he called an ancient discipline, a philosophy that satisfied the intellect in Indian thought. Uh, in the meantime, he discovered that new poems could return into traditional peasant oral culture. Though intellectual Dublin knew nothing of it, he said, Douglas Hyde had considerable popularity as a Gaelic poet. Mowers and reapers singing his songs from Donegal to Kerry. Years after, I was to stand at his side and listen to Galway mowers singing his Gaelic words without their knowing whose words they sang. It is so in India, where peasants sing the words of the great poet of Bengal, Ramandranath Tagore, of course, who's, without knowing whose words they sing. And it must often be so, where the old imaginative folk life is undisturbed. In 1935, he boasted the Free State Army marched to a tune called Down by the Sally Gardens, without knowing that the march was first published with words of mine, words that are now folklore. And I think, myself, of Tread Softly Because You Tread on My Dreams, from He Wishes for the Cloths of Heaven, words which one now hears worked into all sorts of, of contexts. They have returned to folklore. Inspiring others to follow, he left various manifesti about his works which set the background of belief against which he compiled the notebooks that I'm going to talk about. Popular poets, he thought, who had unlearned the unwritten tradition which binds the unlettered to the beginning of time and to the foundation of the world, word, and who have not learned the written tradition that has been established upon the unwritten what we now call popular poetry never came from the people at all. Rather, he says, go down into the street with some thought whose bare meaning must be plain to everybody. Take with you Ben Jonson's Beauty Like Sorrow Dwelleth Everywhere and find out how utterly its enchantment depends upon an association of beauty with sorrow which written tradition has from the unwritten, which had it in turn from ancient religion. Or take with you these lines, in whose bare meaning also there is nothing to stumble over, and find out what men lose who are not in love with Helen. Brightness falls from the air. Queens have died young and fair. Dust hath closed Helen's eye. As a boy in Dublin, he said, he had one unshakable belief. I thought that whatever of philosophy had been made poetry is alone permanent and that one should begin to arrange it in some regular order, rejecting nothing as the make-believe of the poets. Since then, I have observed dreams and visions very carefully, and I'm now certain that the imagination has some way of lighting on the truth that the reason has not, and its commandments, delivered when the body is still and the reason silent, are the most binding that we can ever know. As a scholar, Kathleen Rain depended upon lines of thought such as these. Indeed, some of these quotes appear in some of her essays. In setting them down in writings published at the turn of the, of the century, Yeats drew directly upon two small vellum-bound notebooks. Their high-quality blank pages had been bound in Florence and were probably a gift to him of Maud Gone. Yeats used them in the period that uh, Greville referred to between 11th of July 1898 and the 31st of March 1901, he kept and reread them. They were given by Mrs. Yates to Maud Gone between 1948 and 1951, 
with a dry or perhaps a wry note, saying that perhaps they would mean more to her than they meant to Mrs. Yates herself. She sold them in the late 1960s. Subsequently, they were sold on three or four times. I examined them twice myself in Sotheby's. They're currently sequestered somewhere, nobody knows where, in a private collection. The Yates estate owns the copyright, and Deirdre Toomey and I used them extensively to annotate volume two of the Yates letters, making a preliminary transcription available to Roy Foster for the first volume of his biography of Yates, The Apprentice Mage. We worked from a preservation microfilm of about 50 years ago, scratched, dusty, readable, only if acute eye strain is a condition of employment. <laughs> Writers' notebooks are usually private and often chaotic. Their mixture of genre is often the very thing that one wishes to communicate as a scholar, the cauldron of creative excitement which demands fidelity to the use of the opening or the page. Uh, da Vinci's or Blake's or Flaubert's notebooks each seem incommunicable, but they endlessly throw out insights into the germs of masterpieces. Producing the first modern three-volume edition of Blake in 1893, Yeats and Edwin Ellis sought to rescue Blake as poet and artist from the chaos of his remains to preserve some sense of facsimile while gaining for Blake readability and an audience. The notebooks of Yeats's fellow member of the Order of the Golden Dawn, Florence Farr, who I'll be saying a bit more about later on, known to Yeats as Spillikins, contain wild diagrams from untraced recontite sources, lecture notes from theos theosophical study groups, the mock-up titles of books never published, Coleridge comes to mind here, um, uh, self-laceration in the light of her teaching, grumbles about her lovers, Yeats and Shaw, Wisdom from the Tiger Mahatma, a text, you might say, intended only for one, now scattered in disorder for the many. Such materials rarely reach print. We're much more familiar with the publication of a different class of manuscripts, working drafts, as found, for example, in the Cornell, Wordsworth and Yeats manuscript series, ordered by title of the finished work, towards which the manuscripts mark key moments of progress, imaged sets of pages uh, set side by side with typographical facsimiles. But when a writer himself uses a blank book bound before purchase, the process is much harder to reproduce in facsimile, except, of course, uh, on the net. Yeats liked the two-page spread each opening provided. I'll show you some of the pages. Um, he usually drafted on the right-hand page and added comments on the left-hand page, producing something like this. Now, this first page, that's just the first page, which happens to be a recto, and that's actually a good image taken from the original, um, which will give you just some sense of his handwriting. But much, most of it looks much more like this, um, with horoscopes um, and um, additions. And in this particular case, um, a rather wild-looking chicken with a butterfly hovering over its head um, and as you can see by that v-shaped hasty annotation on the bottom of the left hand page uh, you will see um, what he's hastily trying to do in correcting a drawing which he has which he has xed out um, on the recto page and um, uh, so that's just I I'll be showing you more of these the, the point is that the main text is continually interrupted by additions and interpolations, the possibilities of which he's carefully allowed for by writing only on one side um, and then adding the corrections later. Now, we've all recorded our dreams, but few with a vellum-bound commitment to permanence. Yeats already had a history of writing in bound manuscript books, a lot of them in the National Library of Ireland, the Flame of the Spirit notebook in which he put poems for Maud Gone, the 1893 notebook with a brocade cover which he flaunted for his first interview with Catherine Tynan, the Celtic Twilight scrapbook into which he pasted texts from periodical publications whilst rewriting them at the same time. Um, but one can hardly imagine Yeats ever hauling these visions notebooks out for public view. They were written for a readership of one.
He's unusual among writers who record dream material in that he sought to keep and to annotate a record of dreams and visions separate from the diarising of his outer life. Coleridge, Kafka, Sylvia Plath, for example, record significant dreams in notebooks or diaries alongside the details of their daily life, of books read, poems drafted, health recorded, appointments kept. But I have handled a volume of Graham Greene's dream diaries, which are dedicated solely to dreams. Yeats's warning private that you can see at the top of that page is no mere Cerberus to put people off. It imitates the stern injunctions given in other manuscript books of the period, such as the manuscript books of rituals of the Order of the Golden Dawn, which members themselves had to transcribe and compile. But this is not a book of ritual, though its subject matter is one of the bases for Yeats's own unsatisfactory rituals for a new Celtic mystical order. This is a spiritual diary, a revisited text. Annotating it and editing it, we are trying to recover some sense of its use at various points in Yeats's life thereafter. Once we had deciphered it, it was apparent that much material scattered throughout his published prose and verse utterly depended upon it. It became a quarry for meditative and autobiographical writings, folklore essays such as are found in the 1902 edition of the Celtic Twilight and philosophical writings, such as found in his great philosophical treatise, Paramica Salentia Lunae of 1918. This then is a matrix out of which everything comes. His dreams, some of which are drug induced, his visions, some of which are drug suppressed, um, his occult experiences for that 33 month period provide him with evidence of what he would have called wisdom that had come to him directly from what he would have called, what he did call the anima mundi. In autobiographies, he writes, it was at Cool Park that the first few simple thoughts that now grown complex through their contact with other thoughts explain my world, came to me from beyond my own mind. I practiced meditations, and these, as I think, so affected my sleep that I began to have dreams that differed from ordinary dreams in seeming to take place amid brilliant light and by their invariable coherence and certain half dreams, if I can call them, so between sleep and waking, such experiences come to me most often amid distraction at some times that seems of all times the least fitting as though it were necessary for the exterior mind to be engaged elsewhere. And of course, one remembers that all this happened when he was rushing to and fro in 1898, organizing the centenary of Wolf Tone in Ireland and England. But both his unfinished memoirs and his autobiographies draw upon these singular experiences and their constant interruption by horoscopes, by letters from Mort Gon, uh, um, uh, and by the dreams and visions of other people, many of these being, of course, about Yeats and Maud Gone. Now, the letters and the horoscopes are pasted in in envelopes. And if you look, you will see on, on, on the left-hand page, you will see uh, it says, My Horoscope by Vigilate. It's been pasted in into an envelope. Or if one looks there, there are two envelopes of letters from Maud Gone. And when one uh, opens the envelopes, of course, one finds the even more unreadable handwriting of Maud Gone going on like this. And many of her dreams and her visions are almost concurrent with Yeats's. And he then files them all in the one anthology. Um, and um, there are many, many more pages of horoscopes, um, uh, of, of tarot readings, um, and, um, well, all sorts of, of um, almost indecipherable and very difficult to understand material. Now, he'd become dissatisfied with the elaborate style of some of the stories that he had been writing in 1896-97. These are the stories grouped under the title Rosa Alchemica, and their mode is that of the fantastic, 
the reader hovers between natural and supernatural readings. George Russell had thought Rosa Alchemica a most wonderful piece of prose. A book sustained at that level would be one of the greatest things in literature, and I think Russell was right. But this wouldn't do for Yeats. For Yeats, its style was too elaborate, too ornamental, and embodied too, too little actual circumstance. Nothing natural. Always, he said, an artificial splendor. Um, in an early draft of Paramica Salentia Lunae, he writes, summing up this period, uh, the world of spirits became and still is the great preoccupation of my life, a study that even more than poetry has absorbed my life. That preoccupation needed to be externalised, but there was no way to put such experience before the public. Actual experience of the spirits, real, if frail, visionary experience, and unsatisfactory experiences with both hashish and mescal showed that fantastic or quasi-Gothic fiction was not the way forward. His dissatisfaction led him to seek, via the mediumship of his mistress at the time, Olivia Shakespeare, the advice of a symbolic personality who appeared in her visions called Megarhythma. Um, now that algorithms have become such a common um, form of conversation for the complex workings of artificial intelligence and computers, I like to think that Megarhythma must have been, you know, a sort of super algorithm who advised him to live near waters and to avoid woods because they concentrate the solar ray. Yeats interpreted this advice in terms of the growing artifice of style that he detected in the elaboration of the Rosary Alchemica stories. Water was Luna, referring to all that was simple, popular, traditional, emotional. This enigmatic sentence, he said, came from my own daimon, my own buried self, speaking through my friend's mind. It was thereafter associated with the Archer vision of August, August 1896 in Tillyra Castle, and these two experiences are the most of what we know of Yeats's visionary life before these notebooks. The notebooks also bring to light some of the more recondite activities of a small group of late Fantasiac writers, Irish nationalists, occult experimenters, all via the kaleidoscope of Yeats's inner life. Celtic mythography had been an interest ever since his recording of Folklore for the Celtic Twilight and was key to the symbolic so sources of all his early poems and plays. But here we see him recording the visionary work of himself and others preparatory to the founding of a Celtic mystical order. Um, and that's all in the notebook. Um, the ultimate source of this idea is a story by the Irish writer Nora Hopper called The Gifts of Hugh and Una in her Ballads in Prose, 1894, with its temple of heroes set on an island in the Shannon. Yeats was so obsessed by the story in early 1895, while staying with Douglas Hart Hyde in French Park, County Roscommon, that he wondered whether Castle Island, Lock Key, might not become his temple of heroes, the centre of mysteries like those of Eleusis and Samothrace. For the next ten years, he said, my most impassioned thought was a vain attempt to find philosophy and to create ritual for that order. I had an unshakable conviction that invisible gates would open as the, for me as they opened for Blake, as they'd opened for Swedenborg, as they opened for Burma. And the wider ambition at work, I must find a tradition that was part of actual history that had associations in the, in the scenery of my own country, and so bring my speech closer to that of daily life. Prompted, as I believe, by certain dreams and premonitions, I began a study of the supernatural belief of the Galway and Aran cottages. Now, that Celtic order was not to be part of the Order of the Golden Dawn, of which, of course, he was also a member, but it was to have a similar structure and rights. Various Irish um, visionaries and others helped him in the work to draw up these, um, uh, these rituals. And much that, that happened among these group, this group of people um, show Yeats using people, using visionaries, 
um, uh, to, to obtain experiences which he felt he couldn't obtain himself. One of these is an Irish woman called Dorothea Hunter, who recalled that Yeats could not himself get the visions he so desired. He said his mind was too analytical and questioning. The visions notebooks then contain private work on, on rituals to be structured on the Celtic divinities of the pre-Christian era, about which Yeats had done a lot of reading when writing that early epic, The Wanderings of Oisin, 1889. The Tuha de Danan, the otherworldly tribes of the goddess Danu, associated with ancient Pashit's tombs, portals to the other world, their rivals, the Fomorians, the harmful or destructive powers of nature, whom the Tuha had defeated in the Battle of Moitura, the talismans of the Tuha, the sword, the stone, the cauldron, and the spear, the twelve Irish coloured winds, the four mythical cities, and their respective associated gods, all of these, um, all this learning from mythography gives some sense of system and seems to be the basis for now lost Celtic Tatva cards developed by Yeats and his followers. But from the 12th of September 1898, he's evoking gods and Irish gods and goddesses daily, summoning Angus, Buan, Bove Derrick, and the Diha himself. Thus, last night I evoked Conla's well. I got some new expressions. The nine hazels are fiery and masculine. The water is feminine. The well is the primordial duality. The well is the circle of mind and space. You can see, of course, how he rushes to analyse the very things that, um, that perhaps um, made his visionary power less satisfactory. The trouble is also that his emotional life erupts into all this visionary work, and the unreconciled struggle between the would-be Magus and the man in love with Maud Gon is established right on the second page of the notebook. The intersection explodes in December 1898 at the time of their spiritual marriage, Yeats's work, words. On the 8th of December came catastrophic revelations of Maud Gon's previous secret life, her long and now fractured relationship with the French politician Lucien Millevoix, and of the two children she had borne him. Yeats intensified their shared visionary and, and magical life, um, and by the 17th of December, they experienced in different places, but at the same time, the so-called initiation of the spear, after evoking Angus, who was simul uh, ominously laughing and mocking. He said, we were one, wrote Yeats, in the prenatal life. There are lots of early poems, by the way, on that theme. And this prenatal life was now bringing us together. When asked to show us in that life, he showed her a stone and me a most beautiful golden flame-like form. Presently, presently she saw Lou, who said we could now take the initiation of the spear. She saw a tree with a serpent and a great fountain of fire. The spear was held over us. We were told to hold to it. We rose up through the fire. I saw a kind of feathery flame, like the branches of some kind of trees or bush, or heard sounds as if made by falling and crashing metal. Presently I saw the spear put upright, we holding it no more. I was then drawn up, as it seems, into the form of a great goddess, who seemed like, like Morgan, and like a stone Artemis. I looked out of her eyes. We were told we would get to real initiation in sleep that night and would remember enough to teach others. Well, Maud Gon, two days later, took off for Paris. And Yeats had proposed in the meantime, and she had rejected it, and their relationship was unresolved. Um, meanwhile, enter the two other women, Florence Farr and Olivia Shakespeare, and Yeats records their dreams about all, all of this. Florence Farr had seen him, quote, dressed in some kind of medieval dress, kneeling before a wayside shrine of what seemed to be the Maudlin in what seemed to be Italy. 
She saw a spirit haunting this shrine, the spirit of the woman, and that my longing had made this spirit almost material, given it a body, and that I saw it. She tried to get the history of the spirit. She saw a woman very full of life with whom I was in love. I was some kind of student, and yet some kind of noble. I and this woman quarrelled, but whether she loved me was not quite certain. On the whole, it seems that she did. But there were all kinds of complications, and because of this, the woman killed herself. It was then that her spirit began to haunt the shrine, and I to pray there. I used to pray there for many years, till at last I died, and all the while that I prayed, the woman was full of hate, the hatred of that quarrel. When I was dead, I became a bird and lighted upon a bough and sang my love to the spirit. Anyone hear an early echo, pre-echo there of sailing to Byzantium, I wonder? But she made her hate into a serpent. The serpent climbed a tree and killed the bird. Then the soul that had been the bird became a violet, high up on the hill over the shrine. And now at last the spirit changed from hate to love, became dew and wept over the flower. But the cold of that high hill froze the dew around the flower, and there it remained for many years enclosed in ice, until at last ice and flower perished, the one melting, the other one blackening and withering. Well, his mistress, mistress of the time, Olivia Shakespeare, saw him, quote, in a Persian garden among roses. I was a Greek prisoner and taught many prisoners the Platonic philosophy and made many poems, for I was honoured and well cared for. In the middle of the garden was a marble tomb in which there was a marble image of a very beautiful woman. And in this tomb, I was accustomed to offer incense of sacred herbs that I gathered in the garden and to lie long in trance, communing with her who was buried there, and my longing almost made her a living body. Among the students, most said that no one knew the name of the queen who was buried there a very long time ago, but one said that it was Cyrene. At last, the Persian queen, who loved the man who was myself, became angry because of the woman in the tomb. Um, and he would have, and because he would have no living love, and because he said that no living beauty was like that marble beauty, and she had him thrust in the tomb and fastened the door on him forever. Well, that tomb is an obvious source for the poem called The Living Beauty. Um, and, um, but there aren't the sources of very many poems in this material, um, though the material is used in so many different places. And this spiritual marriage continues to haunt many pages of the book, and its non-consummation keeps reverberating in an extraordinary interlude at Sligo between the 23rd of December and 8th of January, 1899, wild visions of the Irish god Angus as enthusiasm and intoxication, and as an Irish Hermes, alternate with visions of a severed head, bloody or with red hair, brown human skulls, as well as sexually charged visions, such as that of a man with a great tongue too large for his mouth, followed by hallucinations of Mordgon's violet scent. Mainly, Yeats used standard Golden Dawn evocations to induce these visions, meditations upon tatwa cards, symbols of the elements, typically to direct clairvoyance in others, but also used to banish evil or negative visions. They're what the Golden Dawn classified as etheric experiences, i.e. three-dimensional, with the visionary at times a participant. Some visionary experiments recorded a joint. Yeats and the Irish poet George Russell seeking visions of hammer dryads in Liddicorn Castle, County Galway. And there it is um, on the left in a contemporary photograph uh, and on the right in a drawing by Russell done at the time that all this was going on. Um, some of these visions are recorded in the notebook in graphic form by Russell himself. Um, there being one of them, um, this strange pastel drawing um, of, um, of, of an Irish god, suggesting that Irish gods prefigured David Bowie, it seems to me, in a punk headdress, but then many of Russell's otherworldly drawings show resemblances to punk or mohawk styles. Um, and um, these are other drawings done at the same time. 
Much of this visionary activity is also noted solemnly by Lady Gregory. At Lidicorn Castle, they saw visions of a man in armour and a black pig and a tall woman and a black man. A.E. saw all of these, Yeats saw only some of them. Um, now, key episodes from these notebooks are transcribed directly, sometimes glossed with additional memories, plainly mobilised by the process of rereading. Sometimes an experience which is only sketched or recorded fragmentarily in the notebook, for example, George Russell's suicidal impulses at the time, are expanded with greater frankness um, in Yeats's memoirs. He often has visions of books. On Sunday night, or rather early last Monday morning, I went asleep on my back with the result that I seemed to pass through a half-nightmare state of no great importance and then to awake into a kind of beatific trance I was shown two books full of pictures of marvellous and curious beauty and told that one contained lost poems by Blake and the other something, whether doctrine or what, I could not remember that had influenced him. I remember, too, a picture, whether by him or an influence over him, I know not, which was round, a sky full of faces, faces more Greek than his pictures are. I saw diagrams, too, showing Satan and his symbols, rising into the heavens. There was much about his wings. I remember, too, that his hurting the head of Christ meant the maiming of imagination by reason. The poems were beautifully illuminated, though not quite in Blake's way. I read, then I presently came to a bad voice, bad verse, sorry. A voice then said that I was no longer seeing properly. I asked questions, but was told, I think, that I could not hear or see more at that stage. And then, almost immediately, I saw a book written and painted on dual leaves and fixed my eyes on a scene, how indigo on one dark, indigo dark, sorry, on one page, a kind of abyss or the night sky. The book changed into a shower of withered leaves. I then saw other withered leaves. I heard a voice say that the woman in the white dress was a spirit of November and of winter nights. I heard a voice say, your heart is heavy as lead. The light of your eyes is dead. Think of the world to come. We are the whirling ways. I felt a sensation of winds blowing. I saw indigo color and a faint white cross. I was conscious of being unable to see things that were all about me. I saw to my left, but very badly, many laughing faces, and to my right, a sheeted and death-like spirit. I heard a voice cry, lay your hand on my heart and your lips upon my lips. I saw a most radiant and noble face bend over mine, but was conscious of the same struggle to realize things that I could not realize. All the while, I saw Russell with my outer eyes. He was perfectly still, so still that I thought he was unconscious. Suddenly, I saw queer green and spring flowers, and the moment afterwards, Russell awoke. He had seen a great abyss of spirits and great shining things, and a spirit of a man laid in a trance upon a cross, and much more that faded from him as, as he awoke. Well, um, there is, of course, a tradition um, of unfinished poems, poems faded as, fading as they're being written, never being finished, and so on. And maybe Greville might like to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, Russell seems to have had at this stage um, of his life a saintly capac capacity for mystical vision. Conversely, he was, I think, a negligible, if very well-selling poet. Yeats's marginality however, also distinguishes the poet from the magician. Yeats had no talent whatever for constructing rituals for his Celtic order compared to the rituals which were in the order of the Golden Dawn. Conscious of his weaker visionary powers, he tried to enhance his visionary experiences with both hashish and mescal. Yeats was one of the earliest people to be experimented on um, with mescal, uh, written up in the Lancet, incidentally, without giving his name, um, in 1897. Um, but um, actual experiences of drugs seem to have shown him um, that medi medication produced results quite distinct from those obtained by meditation 
or evocation, drugs complicated the matter, and Yeats's record of his use of them, I think, could easily be overstated. Um, at Cool in July 1900, he decided to evoke with apple blossom. I had no true vision, but a visionary dream. I dreamed that I was going through a great city. It had some likeness to Paris around or time at night. Presently, I saw a wild, windy light in the sky and knew that dawn was coming in the middle of the night and that this was the last day. Um, in February 1903, this visionary dream was published as a dream of the world end, world's end in Pamela Coleman Smith's Green Sheep, Sheaf. It offers a phantasmagoric condensation of the events, public and private, I think, of 1898. The published text had an introductory explanatory paragraph. I have a way of giving myself long meaning dreams by meditating on a symbol when I go to sleep. Sometimes I use traditional symbols. Sometimes I meditate on some image which is only a symbol to myself. A while ago, I began to think of apple blossom always associated, of course, throughout his poems with Maud Gone, as an image of the East and a breaking day. And one night it brought me, not as I expected, a charming dream full of the mythology of sunrise, but this grotesque dream about the breaking up of an eternal city. Perhaps grotesque dreams were an occupational hazard of the dreamer caught in a failed thaumaturgy. The magus cannot control visions which, as it were, turn against him. This also seems to be related to Yeats's limited visionary powers. A taxonomy of visionary experiences was to be expected from a writer who re-dreamt materials from his own writing and re-read his own record of visions and dreams as he rewrote. I want to pause for a moment on this re-dreaming and re-reading and rewriting. Um, that Yeats rewrote his poems continually before and after publication and collection is almost the first thing a reader of his work comes to learn, sometimes disarmingly. I've remarked that these notebooks demonstrate only a few particular sources for poems, but they show patterns of obsession with the symbolical subjects of poems already published in some shape or form, but yet to reach their final form, or indeed the forms in which they would be first collected. Yeats's dreams play across the entire symbology of what he'd already published. Plays, poems, the Celtic twilight, the secret rose on the one hand, delving deeper into Celtic folklore, and on the other and less successfully, laying some groundwork for the ordering of the materials into the rites of a Celtic mystical order. There is in all of this a deep solipsism in the writer as a self-reader. In 1893, he drafted a quatrain claiming that his rhyme must be a dyed and figured mystery, thought hid in thought, dream hid in dream. By 1908, reflecting on certain poems in The Wind Among the Reeds, he recalled, when I wrote these poems, I had so meditated over the images that came to me in writing ballads and lyrics, The Rose and the Wanderings of Oisin and other images from Irish folklore, that they had become true symbols. I had sometimes when awake, but more often in sleep, moments of vision, a state very unlike dreaming, when these images took upon themselves what seemed an independent life and became part of a mystic language which seemed that it would bring me some strange revelation. The dreams recorded in the notebooks are partially controlled by the dreamer. These and hypnagogic visions before sleep, concurrent dreams, are analysed in the book of 1918, Paramica Salentia Lunae. There are also waking hallucinations superimposed upon the ordinary non-hallucinatory environment. Failure of true vision was as central to the writer's creative economy as was delay. The composition of The Wind Among the Reeds depended upon obsessive and recurrent imbrication of redreamt dreams. And it becomes a bit like what de Quincey calls involutes of earlier works. Thus, Yeats's 1899 note to the lyric, which everybody knows, entitled The Cap and Bells. 
I dreamed this story exactly as I have written it. I dreamed another long dream after it, trying to make out its meaning and whether I was to write it in prose or in verse. The first dream was more a vision than a dream, for it was beautiful and coherent and gave me the sense of illumination and exaltation that one gets from visions, while the second dream was confused and meaningless. The poem has always meant a great deal to me, um, though, as is the way with symbolic poems, it's not always meant quite the same thing. Blake would have said, the authors are in eternity, and I'm quite sure they can only be questioned in dreams. Well, once he had published these poems, he began to look at them rather differently. Being troubled at what was thought a reckless obscurity, he said, I tried to explain myself in lengthy footnotes into which I put all the little learning I had and more willful fantasy than I now think admirable, though what is most mystical still seems to me the most true. In his introduction to his poems in, 18, in 1901, he said, I do not think that anybody who knows modern poetry will find obscurities in this book immediately qualifying that very rash statement with um, what he... Well, I'll put this on the screen, I think. Um, in any case, I must leave my myths and symbols to explain themselves as the years go by, and one poem lights up another, and the stories that friends, and one friend in particular, that's Lady Gregory, have gathered for me, or that I have gathered myself in many cottages, find their way into the light. I would, if I could, add to the majestic heraldry of the poets, the great and complicated inheritance of images, which written literature has substituted for the greater and more complicated inheritance of the spoken tradition. Some new heraldic images gathered from the lips of the common people. Now finally, I want to say something about the genuine mystical visions that appear in these notebooks. Um, these were very rare um, but here's one recorded on the 27th of August 1898 shortly after the visions of the book of poems I recorded on the 14th of July I had another experience when sleeping on my back I awoke slowly and could not remember what I had seen but knew that I had been told that the love of God was infinite for every human being because every human being is unique and God's love can find no other capable of satisfying the same need. This was mixed up with some, some incoherent dream. I was not in a true trance, but perhaps had been. The day before, I had suddenly felt, felt a sense of dependence of the divine will and had passed for a moment into a state of passive mysticism unusual with my nature, which has been shaped by thaumaturgy. I also had the experience of the wind blowing over me from the feet up again, but cannot recollect the circumstances. In my divination of two or three days ago, I noticed the great difficulty is that the cards produce the vision appropriate to their universal symbolism more readily than the vision of their partial symbolism. This thought came to me, as I believe, supernaturally, he wrote. And this direct experience of the numinous was believed by Yeats to be the root of Christian mysticism. Its rarity guaranteed the poet's place in the scheme of things below the saint or the magus. It fed back directly into what Yeats published as folklore. And the experience I've just recorded recalled was published immediately it seems well very quickly anyway in in 1902 as one of the new chapters of the celtic twilight um linked to a second this is the vision about there being um uh, no human soul is like any other human soul and therefore the love of god for any human soul is infinite because no other soul can satisfy the same need in god a few nights after this, I awoke to see the loveliest people I have ever seen, a young man and a young girl dressed in olive green raiment, cut like old Greek raiment, were standing at my bedside. I looked at the girl 
and noticed that her dress was gathered around her neck into a kind of chain, or perhaps into some kind of stiff embroidery which represented ivy leave, leaves. But what filled me with wonder was the miraculous mildness of her face. There are no such faces now. It was beautiful, as few faces are beautiful, but it had not, one would think, the light that is in desire or in hope or in fear or in speculation. It was peaceful like the faces of animals or like mountain pools in the evening. It was a little sad. Now, um, these experiences are sometimes deployed in works of fiction in his unfinished novel, The Speckled Bird, but they are more frequently to be found um, in his autobiographies, where he sums up this great period of vision and dream. I found that after evocation, my sleep became at moments full of light and form, all that I'd failed to find while awake, and I elaborated a system of natural objects that I might give myself dreams during sleep, or rather visions, for they had none of the confusion of dreams, by laying upon my pillow, or beside my pillow, certain flowers or leaves. Even today, after 20 years, the exhalations and the memories that come to me from bits of hawthorn or some other plant uh, seem, of all the moments of my life, the happiest and the wisest. Well, I just want to um, stop in a second, but let me ask, why did he give up this notebook at the end of, of March 1901? The quarrel in the Order of the Golden Dawn had estranged him from Florence Farr and from Dorothea Hunter, key, key figures in, in his mystical life. The theatre increasingly consumed him, and his own great period of visionary activity just seemed to be over. There might have been or seemed little point in seeking from others than what he could not achieve himself. I see the, tra the trajectory of his work then as something like this. In so far as visionary experience was concerned, Rosa Alchemica and the fantastic as a style had to be written off. Experience had to find a way to prevail over literary convention. Speculative prose took over from fiction. His first published reference to the notebook is in the essay, famous essay called Magic, drafted in December 1900, offered as a lecture in May 1901 and published in, a little later in 1901. Though it includes one episode from the notebook, Yeats wrote, I have written of these breakings forth, these loosenings of the deep, with some care and some detail, but I shall keep my record shut. We who write, we who bear witness, must often hear our hearts cry out against us, complaining because of their hidden things. Um, and uh, so there it really remains. It remains for him as a book of evidence to himself that he had undergone a period of vision, however fragmented, and was not simply dependent on the powers of, powers of others. The problem for Yeats's belief in visionary experience, I would suggest, is that he was a writer. Representing experience of the supernatural to unbelievers, he found inordinately difficult. Affirmation by declaration proved for him to be the best accommodation of the supernatural. In a draft of Paramica, he wrote that the notebooks contained much recorded at the moment it happened, and while the memory was clear, that once I had thought to publish, but I am no longer of that mind. Why should I hope to convince when notably accurate and careful men have failed? I am an imaginative writer, and so must appear to be one of those who lose themselves in the fancy. I will but say, like the 12-year-old boy in the Arabian Nights, O oh brother, I have taken stock in the desert sand and of the sayings of antiquity. I'll stop there. Um, I have a question um, to ask later on, but some of you may have questions first. Thank you.
I'm sure, like everyone here, um, I'm very reluctant to allow Warwick to cease. I mean, he's, he, has, he has gripped us with his glittering eye like the ancient mariner, um, and <coughs> like Yeats, he's, he's been weaving the cloths of heaven for us. Um, I could listen to this all night, but I fear <laughs> Warwick wouldn't wish to continue all night. Um, Yes, um, we're, we're invited to, to raise questions. Um, do, do we have questions? I'm sure there will, there will be many, yes. Um, lady. Yeah. Are, you, are you able to? Yes. Yes. Well, it's a very simple question. Would Yeats have seen an original manuscript of Blake's? Yes, is the answer. Wonderful. Yes, it's many, many, many of them. Uh, the Linnell brothers, um, were still alive and Yeats and Ellis went down to their house I think in Kent and indeed carried away some of Yeats's manuscripts in order to transcribe them before publishing them in 1893. Thank you. Yes, do we, do we have any more? Yes. <coughs> Thank you. I was very struck by the dream about the cities breaking down. Ah, uh, yes. Well, that, that one, of course, is published. It is. Yes, it um, is. But the, um, but the time that he was having these dreams, um, and, of course, at the same time, he was trying to reconstruct the Irish order of consciousness yes. and the soul of Ireland yes. at the same time. But at this very same time, he has the breaking down of the cities um, and, of course, all that follows in Irish history in the next... Um, um, two decades um, strikes me very forcibly. It's often it's often said in in Scottish culture that um, uh, that the the vision of the fairy um, when one goes into um, the other world um, one is aware of war in the other world before it comes out into this world. I see. It's very interesting. He's yes. got this creative and these destructive st streams both at the same time. I wonder if you had anything... No, I mean, uh, first of all, the, the Scottish material is new to me. Thank you yeah. very much. Um, I, uh, what I'd be wary of saying... Um, um, I'd be wary of oversimplifying this to the point when one suddenly said, you know, that in 1898, Yeats had foreseen 1916. Um, I mean, I, I'd be very wary of, of going there because I think that what happened in 1916 was an enormous surprise to Yeats and one, of course, which he had first deplored. Um, and, um, but um, whether it is his desire for a new Ireland that, um, as I think you're suggesting, um, uh, implies that the old order has to be broken up or whether it's just one of those terrifying dreams. You need to read the whole thing. It's the weirdest, weirdest experience to dream of the world's end. Um, it also involves men descending in parachutes. <laughs> but um, uh, it, is, um, it is something that struck him as so singular. It's, it stands out very much from the rest of the material in this document. Um, I wonder if I could ask a question of everyone. Um, uh, I did, when, when writing this, I did read carefully the Temenos Academy's 10 basic principles. And I asked myself, would Yeats have signed up <laughs> to your principles? Um, and I went through them all principle by principle and, you know, could comment on, on most of them, I think. But the one which really sticks in my mind uh, in, in respect of Yeats is would he have reminded himself and others to look up and not down, principle number nine. Here it seems to me is where Neoplatonism and the occult come into conjunction, if not collision. Um, it gathers up, this question gathers up Temenov's beliefs two to five about love of wisdom, spiritual vision as the basis of civilization, revered traditions, and the necessity for their constant renewal. But it did seem to me um, that um, 
principle nine about looking up and not down was quite important because it made me think immediately of Raphael's School of Athens um, and of, of course, the figures of Plato and Aristotle, the one gesturing up, um, while Aristotle, of course, gestures down. That, by a curious chain of, of, of coincidence, reminded me of a late cartoon of Yeats and, <laughs> and, Yeats and, and George Russell. Yeats lived at number 84, Marion Square, at this stage. Russell worked at number 82. And here they are, not meeting outside number 83. Um, Russell, by this stage, of course, being um, a truly profound and very brave journalist, um, editor of the Irish Statesman. Now, Yeats, I think, affirmed looking in before looking up. Our memories being for him part of one great memory, the memory of nature herself. A great mind which could be evoked by symbols, a process which he thought it uncontroversial to call magic. Written even as these notebooks were being compiled, as spirits were being evoked, in a quest for visions of truth in the depths of the mind when the eyes are closed. But while he says he wishes he could put the belief in magic from him, he also fears the consequences for humanities of the slow perishing through the centuries of a quality of mind that makes that belief and its evidences common in the world. Now, by the time you get to his age, his Nobel Prize winner, um, in 1927, 28, he writes a poem, of course, in which he writes his will. Um, trapped by the humiliations of old age, he um, decides it's time to declare his faith. And this is where it's surprising for those who feel that looking up is platonic, and that's what Yeats did. Um, and I declare my faith, he says. I mock Plotinus' thought and cry in Plato's teeth. Death and life were not till man made up the whole, made lock, stock and barrel out of his bitter soul. I, sun and moon and star, all, and further add to that, that being dead, we rise, dream and so create translunar paradise. And it seems to me this is his wonderful, wonderful phrase, being dead, um, that this is, this is where we each add, as it were, our separate wisdom via supernatural dreams to human tradition.